Hi everyone and welcome to my first uh, flip classroom lecture. This is Buchanan. He is feeling very antsy as it is Sunday afternoon while I'm trying to record. So please bear with me if uh, you hear anything on the microphone. It's probably him trying to play with me while I record my lecture. Um, just want to say thank you guys for bearing with me on this and I hope that you appreciate all of this so that maybe we can do this again but let's get going right Buchanan let's learn about Puritans oh and before I forget um, some of the transitions for the PowerPoint slides will be a little odd at times I did not create the original PowerPoint um, slide I've edited a lot of the material as well as how it looks but the transitions that's a completely different thing so if it seems odd at times just kind of bear with me as we go through it some of my other lectures and notes um, I've completely designed from top to bottom so this is one of the few that is like this all right let's go going ah bye guys so today our lecture is going to be on Puritan beliefs and the Salem witch trials. We also talk about a few of the Puritan authors and writers that we should know, but that will be a secondary concern because we just need to talk mostly about Puritan beliefs leading up to the Salem witch trials. Now if you know anything about the Salem witch trials, we know that people were falsely accused of practicing witchcraft. What you may not understand though is the lead up to that movement and how Puritan beliefs have set many of America's standards. Some of us might already know who the Puritans are. If you studied basic American history, then you know that the Puritans actually colonized America. But the group itself is actually referring to a movement for reform or change. That is how their religion and society came to be because of a reform movement. This reform happened during the late 1500s into the early 1600s. Uh, this reform movement took place within the Church of England. The Church of England had already faced its own schism in the early 1500s with Henry VIII. Um, England was originally a Catholic state, but as some of you might know, um, he wanted to practice some different marriage rules against the Catholic Church, and so he created a break or schism within the Catholic Church to form the Church of England, um, which the king or queen is then the head of. Now, the Puritans came about sometime between Queen Elizabeth I and King Charles I. Their reform wouldn't be going back to Catholicism, but would actually refer back to some of the ideas that King Henry VIII had established already. These types of ideas would be more formally known as the basis of Protestantism. So, how did the Puritans get from England over to America? Well, for that, we need to talk about some of the history of England with Catholicism. So mind you, the Puritans and the Church of England had only been around for less than 100 years. Catholic influence within England was still incredibly strong, and the Puritans felt as if the Church of England still had too much of that influence within its practices. So they took the basis of their religion from King Henry and also built upon the ideas of John Calvin. Now we'll talk a little bit more about John Calvin at a later time, but here are some of the basic ideas behind Calvinism and Catholicism. The Puritans wanted the church to declare that they had no supreme authority over God, that there wasn't one figure within the church who spoke for the authority of God. It was God alone who decided one's fate. It wasn't the church who had control over your destiny. This is directly against Catholic teachings who would decide essentially for each person what someone's destiny was or what their sins were, uh, where they were already headed, heaven or hell or purgatory. So Puritans were against this practice. They believed God alone had that power. Now, King James and his son Charles I, they were having some issues with Parliament. If you are unsure as to what Parliament is, uh, they are equal to our own Congress. Um, during this time, a lot of people felt like England was not the same after Queen Elizabeth I died. It was a very hard transition in government between James and then Charles. Now they wanted to dissolve Parliament and the Puritans are completely for order and established order, and they were in favor of keeping Parliament. So we have a religious group here who is essentially going against not only the head of state, but also someone who is supposed to be the head of the church. Charles I, seeing this dissent, 
demanded that those who were not in support of the Church of England, otherwise known as the Anglican Church, they had to be killed. So religious per persecution then began for the Puritans in England. It was no longer safe for them to practice their version of the Church of England, and this was a sign for them to leave. This is the part of the story that most of you already know from elementary school. So the Puritans left England to go to the new colonies. Then they separated themselves from the new Anglican Church to establish their own. They left in 1620 and they established Massachusetts, otherwise known as the Bay Colony. So at first, things are going well for the Puritans. They are in a new world with a new beginning free from religious persecution, and even though they're going to be facing a lot of hard work to establish completely new towns and cities, they are willing to do this task. So what we have here is called the city upon a hill theory. If you've never been to Boston, it's incredibly hilly, so that's where the name comes from. Uh, this new Massachusetts colony is an opportunity for the Puritans to have a place of complete reform. We're going back again to that original definition, which means reform or change. So their main practices will be that God is found in scripture, um, so God is only found in the Bible, and also they would have a very stern work ethic. Those are the two main foundations of the Puritan movement when they got to Massachusetts. Um, ideally for some, many believe that this Puritan reform movement wasn't necessarily a bad idea. Many of their original beliefs were actually quite amazing when we look back at them. For example, the Puritans placed a heavy emphasis, uh, a strong belief that education was absolutely needed and education would mostly be used in order to read scripture like the Bible. This isn't a bad idea in a sense because they value the Bible, they value the scripture, and if it leads to education for all of their practitioners so they can read, then I think that's a pretty good foundation to start with. So the first public school was founded in 1635. Harvard College was originally meant to educate ministers who would then obviously teach scripture to the people. Now, many of you know Harvard, and I'm sure some of you may not have known that it was founded by the Puritans. In 1647, they actually passed an act that would ensure that every town that had a population over over 100 people would make sure that their citizens attended grammar school for free. Grammar school today would otherwise be known as elementary school or at least middle school. At this time, people stopped attending school usually by the age of 12. Um, this was a big idea because ed education up until this point was a privilege for those who had money. There was not one area other than universities or colleges that people could attend for higher education. Um, so these grammar schools were free education meant to make sure that you could read scripture and be a part of Puritan society. Now, along with education, let's talk about what the Puritans contributed to the American national identity. Many of our basic values that we can identify in society came from the Puritan beliefs and work ethic. Um, first of all, we have independence. We have a group of people here who have created their own schism and left their original church in order to be free from religious persecution and to be independent so they can practice their own beliefs. Also, patriotism. These are people who are incredibly proud of their heritage, their roots, and the area that they live in. They found great pleasure in what they had established. For industry, industry, they were some of the hardest working people we know of in American history. And we can credit a lot of America's idea of work, 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 work to their stern work ethic. Um, also, practicality, otherwise known as common sense. These were not a people of luxury. They liked practical solutions. Now, we will come back to that comment a little bit later when we get into how the Puritans changed from this value. Um, and lastly, tolerance. This is a value that definitely falls to the wayside in parts of not only American history, but also in the history of Puritans themselves. In addition, a sense of justice. They created their own legal system and justice system, and we'll get into some of that when we get into the Salem Witch Trials, but they definitely wanted to make sure that there was a court system in place that wouldn't necessarily persecute people because of religious practices. This is where we do get into some of the issues, though, here, all of the developing villages and colonies, they began to change politically and religiously because of that value of independence. Remember, they like structure and order as well, so keep this in mind for later. Continuing on the American national identity, they were the first to build upon the idea of the American dream. They didn't necessarily come up with that term, but they definitely created the basis of it. 
So if we work hard, we can achieve a new life. This is an idea that this new path could be forged no matter what and that their goals were attainable. Uh, and from there, we have this inherited emphasis for our country's values on hard work, a strong sense of religion, a duty to one's country, and also freedom from oppression. You might be familiar with that last term because of the Revolutionary War and wanting to be free from oppression from Britain. Let's come back now to the idea of the Puritan beliefs. So we're also going to talk about some of the goals and practices. What they're aiming to do is to cleanse culture of corrupt and sinful practices. What they mean by this is that they're going to completely eradicate this from society and from the people, corrupt and sinful practices. They're not even going to consider the idea of sin and forgiveness like the Catholic Church has. They don't want you to even commit an act of sin and be forgiven for it. So this is where we get into some of the issues that will lead to the Salem Witch Trials. Remember, they believed in a sense of justice, but the sense of justice that they want is for the civil government or justice system to have to strictly enforce public morality by prohibiting vices. Now, vice is obviously something not good for you, but technically in a free society, just because something is not good for you, it doesn't mean that you should not be able to do it at all. But what the Puritans are emphasizing here is that public morality means you should never be able to do this and you should be punished by the government for it. You'll see the basis of this in American society even later into history with the prohibition of alcohol. Now, once again, this is going back to completely splitting from the Catholic Church. The Puritans are saying, hey, let's completely remove ourselves from their practices. We cannot have the Puritans having any sort of common area with the Roman Catholics. Going back to those earlier beliefs we talked about, the church had no supreme authority over God. God makes the final decision about your life. Remember, they believe heavily in reading scripture, in following scripture. So often these worship services were simple because they followed the scripture. They were also very long and they were learned sermons, meaning that clergy members or pastors are just going to have learned their sermons straight from passages of the Bible. There's really no room for any of the fancier analogies using real life examples or stories. They are truly just trying to use passages from the Bible. You might have seen this method before in some churches today for other Christian religions, whether Methodist, Baptist, or Presbyterian. These pastors or ministers are also using a lot of passages from the Bible. Um, this is due to the influence from some of the early Puritans. The funny part is that this following of scriptures is still slightly similar to the Catholic version. Puritans are just saying it in English instead of Latin to make it more accessible for the congregation to understand. All right, here's where we get into some of the major issues with Puritans. We have this idea of the visibly godly. So to be a Puritan, you had to lead a very public and visible life. You had to be incredibly sober in another word for moderate and upright. Visibly, you could do no wrong in the public eye. And remember, even your private life at home might not truly be private because we're talking about servants, we're talking about nosy neighbors, we're talking about this public morality where you're not allowed to commit a sin at all or be forgiven for it. So there's a lot of pressure on the society to be an upright member so that they can participate in one of the biggest activities in society, which is the church. There were strict standards for admission, you not only had to live this life, but you also had to give a public testimony to your experience of conversion if you hadn't been born into Puritan society. This is definitely an exclusive society, despite the fact that they themselves had already faced such intense religious persecution and were supposed to be accepting and tolerant. So we've come to my favorite part about the Puritans, the conversion and predestination theories. The Puritans believed that human beings were innately sinful. So not only were you not allowed to commit a sin at all and be forgiven like in the Catholic Church, but you were born sinful. So you just didn't have a chance at all. Humans were depraved, they were evil, and were relying on the mercy of God to put us in heaven. God only had a small amount of people that he was going to spare. These elect individuals were going to be the ones who got into heaven and that's all that matters. Not only were you supposed to be a good Puritan, but you were committed to saying that you were supposed to be thankful and that you deserved the fate of hell. It's an idea that I'm still not quite sure how they logically pass that off to the congregations, but you know what? 
I wasn't there, we're not there, so we'll roll with it for now. So the idea of you are already destined for heaven or hell, that is the concept of predestination. So now what we're asking, is this idea of predestination unfair to the people who are practicing it? This is essentially implying that God is distinctly undemocratic as a deity. He's already determined how you even live your life because he knows your entire fate. I'm still not sure how it all works, but we'll go with it. There is no incentive though for upright moral behavior. So Puritans are essentially living their lives, not knowing if they're that small elect or if they've been destined for hell. So they're essentially being scared straight into good behavior. But in the back of their mind, they're supposed to believe I'm not worthy. I'm going to hell anyway. But just in case, I've got to live a morally upright life. So if I'm that elect individual, I've earned it. And God determined my fate exactly. It's an interesting idea for the Puritans. It's just incredibly complicated and very depressing to live underneath that kind of pressure. But going back to the idea of John Calvin and Calvinist theology, they're saying that human beings do not have any free will. God already determined your fate, every action you've taken or will take is not actually free will, it is fate determined by God. But we've come to this question of why did so many people believe this? Okay, here's the thing. People wanted order at this time. There was already so much uncertainty, so much change, so much to the new world that was terrifying for people to live in. So people accepted this idea of a comfortable doctrine. They believed if I live a morally upright life and believe I'm a saved person, I'm going to be just fine. I'm scared of hell, but I know if I live life like I'm supposed to and follow this order, I'll be just fine. Also, we're dealing with major changes in the 15th and 16th centuries. I won't go into the concepts of all the science, technology, and historical changes, but there was a lot of uncertainty at this time and people don't necessarily react well to change. They don't necessarily always adapt well, even if they work hard at it. So these times were very unsettling. So people needed that social order that the Puritan society was providing. They needed intellectual and moral certainty that the pastors were actually sermonizing. They needed this spiritual consolation that everything was already determined for them and that their choices and decisions weren't actually going to be as impactful as they thought because God had already seen them through it. Going to the next slide. This is the doctrine of predestination. It answers the specific needs that the Puritans had um, at the time. It offers a wider message that there is no free will or plan undetermined. God is going to triumph over evil because he has a plan for all of human history. Now, this is an overarching theme, an archetype in human history. This idea of good versus evil, it's been around for much longer than Christianity and so on and so forth. So the fact that there was a doctrine of predestination in Puritan society that was offering peace in a way, it was very soothing and comforting to these people who were going through a radical change in their lives by establishing a new colony in America. Continuing on that note of the doctrine of predestination, it made every person in Puritan society, society feel valuable because they had a role to play, because God put them on this earth to fulfill the fate he had seen and created for them. And Puritans, no matter what you did in life, it was meaningful. You were meant to be on earth at that time. No matter the strivings and sufferings that were produced in your life, it, that was what was meant for you. It was sort of a peace and security considered almost a heaven on earth for you because they considered that to just be life. Um, it wasn't that God was out to get them or that the devil was out to get them. It was that this was what was supposed to happen for them in order to live their life. Okay, so this is how they reconcile the idea of predestination into their daily life. Because of predestination, they wanted to make sure that their society and government agreed with the will of God. They had to completely reshape this image of society and government to follow the will of God. So they had to lead godly and disciplined lives. We're going back to the idea that you cannot commit a sin. You have to lead a moral and upright life. And if you didn't, you were subject to public morality laws that the government was going to enforce because they wanted their one society to function in this way. So here was something else. Because all humans were supposed to be born evil, 
They believed that if you could master evil inclinations, this was the evidence that you were one of the ones who were the elect, who was obviously getting into heaven. Mastering an evil inclination was supposed to be avoiding temptation of some sort. It's an odd area, and I'm not quite sure how much evidence there truly is to support this idea. I don't know how many people would have just come out in the society um, and declared they had resisted temptation. I feel like this was an odd circumstance to be faced with because no one wanted to be morally judged. So there's not much more I can say on that other than, once again, the Puritans seem to have odd contradictions at time. So salvation can only be achieved through God's mercy in the Puritan society. God has seen what is in your heart to determine your fate, and you need to make sure you live that upright and moral life so that you can prove that you were the elect individual. So if you live a godly and moral life, this was the encouraging sign that not only were you receiving the grace of God, because remember, he knew all of your choices and decisions. There was no free will. So if you did godly acts, you were doing what you're supposed to do, and this would lead to salvation. But your behavior didn't necessarily mean that this was the cause of your salvation. Remember, God's already determined, no matter what, if you're worthy. So there was an opportunity for people to behave in questionable ways and still technically receive salvation. But people didn't want to risk that, so they wanted their greater reassurance of salvation by essentially using good behavior, by making sure they lived their life in a way that was acceptable. We've come to the part of the lecture where we get into the idea of bad behavior and the world of wonder. Both the ordinary and the educated people of Puritan society believed in these things, which is the power of Satan to take a visible form, the foretelling power of dreams and omens and signs, strange prodigies, monstrous births, and miraculous deliverances. The Puritans were a suspicious and superstitious bunch, and all of this leads into the Salem Witch Trials. Now, some of these beliefs, they do come from earlier parts of Christianity. The Catholic Church uh, is especially one for uh, the witches and the foretelling power of like omens and signs. But um, Henry VIII, as the original leader of the Church of England, was also interested in the idea of witchcraft and evil demons, devils. Um, and we would also see these ideas continued in the reign of King James as well as King Charles I. Um, I want to go in a little more in depth about this world of wonder or these su superstitious beliefs. We're going to talk more about witches in the actual Salem witch trials portion of the lecture, but let's talk about the other ones. The power of Satan to assume visible form was an interesting idea. Um, it was supposed to be that Satan was this entity that might tempt you in areas of your life, um, but the Puritan believed that Satan could take a form in monsters, uh, that he could send his demons to possess others. You could actually physically meet with Satan in the real world. Um, there are other parts of American literature where the visible form of Satan also appears, but we'll get to that at a later portion of the semester. Um, now, the foretelling power of dreams and omens uh, and signs, that is something that I believe has appeared throughout many areas of life. We're talking about symbols or coincidences that just seem to speak to people. If you want to talk about dreams, let's just remember again the origin myth of the world on turtle's back. Strange prodigies. This is referring to people who were exceptionally talented. Some people distrusted prodigy, prodigies. Um, to be exceptional in an area was seen as quite odd. So some people would distrust and even condemn people for being incredibly talented. Monstrous birth. This is not referring to the idea of twins or multiple multiple births, although I do believe some people took it that far. Um, we're talking about children that were obviously born with odd birthmarks as well as possibly deformed limbs, children who may have been born with anything odd at birth. Um, there might even be attempts to kill the child very soon after its birth. For miraculous deliverances, some of this is just them attributing things we now know with science, but at the time, were considered the acts of God. Um, you could have something happened 10 years ago and Puritans would claim later was a miraculous deliverance because it led to some amazing feat later on. 
We've come officially to the end of part one of this lecture. Uh, I've officially been working for now three hours on part one and it's been a learning lesson, but uh, I've enjoyed it, this process and I hope that you have as well. Um, my dog is officially very tired and groaning and he definitely needs a break from this and I definitely need a break. So hopefully part one worked for you guys and we'll see you in part two of the video.